but especially now, revive us again. Let's sing it all together. 434. We praise thee, O God, for the Son of thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive Let's turn to 562, 562, and we'll sing, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Welcome back tonight. It's good to be together again. And uh, I was downstairs doing some things in my office for the last hour, and it was a beautiful thing to hear the choir up here singing. They sounded great. Psalm sounds wonderful. And uh, I got to hear one, pretty much the final uh, rehearsal, and it just sounded awesome. So good job, choir. Maybe I wasn't in it, and that's why it sounded so good. But I, I really enjoyed listening to that and looking forward to hearing it next Sunday. And it was great to see the choir loft full of people. So what a wonderful thing that is. Amen. And to see some new faces up there as well. Uh, I'm excited about tonight and being together. And uh, we are happy that God has been good to us. And I pray and trust that you have had a wonderful afternoon. I had one of those afternoons where I went here, there, and everywhere. And, uh, and so I'm glad to be here tonight. And we hope that the Lord will speak to our hearts. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on this service. Father, we thank you for this time this evening. I pray that you would be with us uh, in all that is happening here. I pray that you would use the message tonight to be a help to your people. 
And Lord, I pray that it would simply be your word speaking to our hearts. Thank you for your word. Thank you for what it means to us. Uh, Lord, without it, we wouldn't know how to function in this life. But you were good enough to us to give us your word. And we are blessed to live in the day and age in which we have uh, the full canon of scripture. And I pray that we would never take that for granted. And so, Lord, have your way with us tonight. Thank you for all that you have done and will do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I'm going to ask our ushers to come. I'm not going to repeat all the announcements uh, that I gave this morning, but I do hope that you got a bulletin today because that bulletin has a lot of important information. Next Sunday is Mother's Day. We want to encourage all of our moms to be here. Uh, ask your mom to come with you to church. If she lives locally or if she'll be in town, we would love to have your mom here or your daughter here. It would be great to see uh, them with us. And so I encourage you for Mother's Day, have them come. We will have uh, our usual uh, flower that we'll give to every mom. But we also have a specific book that we're going to have available for every lady in attendance. And if you're a young wife or a wife of any age, we have a book for you. If you're a mom of children still in the home, we have a book for you. And if you are a more seasoned lady and you've raised your children and you're in that you know, later phase in life, we have a book that we're going to give to you as well. So I want to encourage all of our, all of our ladies to be here. Got to be here to get the book, okay? So come and uh, we hope and pray that it, it will be a blessed time and a blessed Sunday. And I didn't mention this this morning, but we are having men's prayer meeting this coming Saturday. So I want to encourage you to come this Saturday, 8 a.m., men's prayer meeting. We hope that you'll be here. And uh, that's the usual first Sunday of the month. And in the fellowship hall, we'll have donuts and coffee. We'll have a devotion that'll be shared and it'll be a blessing all the way around. So I hope you can be here. And then the first Sunday in June, uh, Brother Chick, he said that he would like to have the, the all-out breakfast that uh, Saturday. It's been a while since we've done it. And so I said, that sounds awesome. So he's going to do that. And maybe we'll get Brother Williams to help. And Brother Steve already said he's good to go for the pancakes. And so that's good. And uh, so, but that's next month, all right? You get some good donuts and coffee, though, this Saturday, and there's always prayer, there's always a devotion, there's always fellowship. Uh, I would encourage our men, and if you're here tonight or if you're listening online, start making that a habit. It, it, we, we encourage you just to come the first Sunday of every month, and you'll find there's good fellowship, it's important for the men to be together and pray, and uh, you'll be blessed by that time together. And then remember, there are new connection classes that are starting in just a couple weeks. And so we have the sign-up sheets. Some people were looking for the sign-up sheets. They're just behind the glass on this side in front of the two rows of chairs, okay? They're not at the usual info table. And uh, so do sign up for a class. It's important that we have all the names signed up for each class. We're going to be a part of that. And uh, we know the Lord will bless those t uh, classes, and we encourage you to be a part of them. We have materials to give out, books to give out. And really what it does is it allows you to be plugged into our church through a smaller group. And uh, sometimes we get lost in the mix a little bit at church. But if you can be a part of a smaller group, uh, you'll find that there's connections that are made, and there's friendships that are strengthened and that are started that otherwise maybe you wouldn't be able to have. And so I want to encourage you to sign up for those. And uh, Sunday, May 15th will be the start of our new adult connection classes. Keep those uh, classes in prayer as well. It's time for us to collect the evening offering. Oh, let me say something as well. God's been very good. We're just right at under $2,000 that's been given for Grace Christian School. That's a great amount. They'll be so happy to, that we were able to give that. And so thank you for your giving. Uh, some have asked, uh, if I can't give till the evening, can I still give it? Yeah, you can give it in tonight's offering and just designate it as Grace Christian School, okay? Uh, what a great offering that was, and thank you for your involvement. We know the Lord will bless that. Brother Sonny Matthews, would you pray for the offering tonight, please?
And that's a beautiful song about our dependency on the Lord. Would you take your hymnal now and turn to 696, 696. And we'll sing, God leads us along. If you would, please stand with me. We'll sing all three verses, the first two verses, and then we'll greet one another tonight, and then sing the last. In a shady green pasture, so rich and so sweet, God leads his dear children along. So may the weary ones feet, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God leads song in the night season and all the day long. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright, God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley in the darkest of night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, God gives a song in the night season and all the day long. We'll sing the third in just a moment. Greet those around you tonight. Good to see everyone here. that chorus and then the third some through the waters some through the
good singing tonight. Thank you. You may be seated. wonderful good job girls and mrs. Cushel that was awesome I loved it I, I feel like it's an extra credit special treat when you get a Sunday night special and especially when you get some pretty girls and uh, their mom that sings wonderful wonderful job that was awesome and I love the message of the song God's love is just continuous isn't it and uh, it never ends never stops what a wonderful truth that is. We are in 2 Samuel tonight. 2 Samuel chapter number 14. 2 Samuel chapter number 14. As we continue now in David's life, just to kind of bring us up to speed, you'll remember that some of the retribution and the consequences of his sin have now started to visit his own home. And we have seen now that just as Nathan the prophet said, the sword uh, would begin to visit his home. And as he said, it would never leave his home. And that has now come to fruition as we saw last week when his son Absalom killed his other son Amnon. And it's difficult for David, no doubt, to be dealing with this. And we continue now, <clears throat> as we read in 2 Samuel chapter number 14, David is grieving. After Absalom kills his brother Amnon, he flees to Geshur. And if you'll remember, uh, Absalom is the son of Machah, who is from Geshur. And so he has family there. At the very least, his mom's family probably still resides there. And it's the place where he finds refuge after committing the crime 
of premeditated murder. Bitterness that sat in his heart for two years caused him to finally murder his own brother Amnon. And it, it was a crime. It was wicked. And he flees and finds refuge in that place. And David has obviously grieved over this. And we pick up the reading now in chapter 14 and verse 1. And there the Bible says, Now Joab the son of Zariah perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. And when we read that his heart was toward Absalom, we have to understand that he was, you know, concerned about his son. And obviously I think he's extra concerned because he knows that this has come about due to his own sin. David himself was a murderer, a premeditated murderer. And although it didn't at all excuse what Absalom did, he feels as though he is intricately tied into this situation, because he is, and he's grieved over it. His right-hand man, his captain of the host, Joab, who at some times is a great friend and a great counselor, at other times a thorn in his side and honestly uh, wicked, I, if he, he's one of these people in scripture. Sometimes he's good and a help. Sometimes he's not. Overall, I think he causes a lot of grief himself in David's life. He concocts a plan. Re, we'll read in verse 2. And Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched thence a wise woman and said unto her, I pray thee, feign thyself to be a mourner and put on now mourning apparel and anoint not thyself with oil. But be as a woman that had a long time mourned for the dead. You see what Joab's doing? He's creating a false situation. Verse 3, And come to the king and speak on this manner unto him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. And when the woman of Tekoa spake to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance and said, Help, O king. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, I am indeed a widow woman, and mine husband is dead. And thy handmaid had two sons, and they two strove together in the field. And there was none to part them, but the one smote the other and slew him. And behold, the whole family is risen against thine handmaid. And they said, Deliver him that smote his brother, that we may kill him, for the life of his brother whom he slew. And we will destroy the heir also. And so they shall quench my coal which is left, and shall not leave to my husband neither name nor remainder upon the earth. And the king said unto the woman, Go to thine house, and I will give charge concerning thee. And the woman of Tekoa said unto the king, My lord, O king, the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. And the king said, Whosoever saith aught unto thee, Bring him to me, and he shall not touch thee any more. Then said she, I pray thee, let the king remember the Lord thy God, that thou wouldest not suffer the revengers of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of thy son fall to the earth. Then the woman said, let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak one word unto my lord the king. And he said, Say on. And the woman said, Wherefore then hast thou thought such a thing against the people of God? For the king does speak this thing as one which is faulty, that word there be, being guilty, and that the king doth not fetch home again his banished. For we must needs die and are as water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Neither doth God respect any person, yet doth he devise means that his banished be not expelled from him. Now therefore, that I am come to speak of this thing unto my lord the king, it is because the people have made me afraid. And thy handmaid said, I will now speak unto the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his handmaid. For the king will hear to deliver his handmaid out of the hand of the man that would destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of God. Then thine handmaid said, The word of my lord the king shall now be comfortable. For as an angel of God, so is my lord the king to discern good and bad. Therefore the Lord thy God will be with thee. Then the king answered and said unto the woman, 
Hide not from me, I pray thee, the thing that I shall ask thee. And the woman said, Let my lord the king now speak. And the king said, Is not the hand of Joab with thee in all this? And the woman answered and said, As thy soul liveth, my lord the king, can, uh, none can turn to the right hand or to the left from aught that my lord the king hath spoken. For thy servant Joab, he bade me, and put all these words in the mouth of thine handmaid, to fetch about this form of speech, hath thy servant Joab done this thing, and my Lord is wise, according to the wisdom of an angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. And the king said unto Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom again. And Joab fell to the ground on his face, and bowed himself, and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy sight my lord, O king, and that the king hath fulfilled the request of his servant. I'm going to stop there and we'll pick up the rest of the chapter as we go through the message. Typically, when people write about King David's life or when they preach through his life, this chapter is just left out. They kind of just skip over it. Uh, even well-known preachers and commentators that I read, most of them just didn't cover this. And I really don't know why, because I think there's some good lessons here. Part of it might be because it's hard to kind of surmise all that's going on and exactly what this story is all about. But I think if we'll just see what the Bible says, we can learn some valuable lessons that will help us. And so let's pray and ask the Lord's help this evening. Father, we pray <clears throat> that you would be with us. Thank you for the, your word. We think tonight of unresolved issues. They come up in our life. We all have issues and problems. And sometimes they go unresolved, sometimes for years, sometimes for even longer, maybe decades or more. And they need to be dealt with. And Lord, I pray that we would understand and see the right way to deal with them. We'll trust you in this. Help us to learn from, again, another example here in scripture of this man, David, who is after your own heart. And I pray that it would be applicable to everyone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. David is saddened. David is grieved. He's had one of his sons kill his other son. I, I can't even begin to imagine what that would be like. And if you can put yourself in David's shoes for a moment, you can understand how sad he must have been because he knows he's responsible for this. His son Absalom, who committed the crime and committed the murder, flees to Geshur, and David is just upset. He wants his son to be back, but he refuses to deal with his son in the proper way, probably because he knows that he himself was a murderer. And so to punish his son, who did the same thing that he did, he feels like would be hypocritical. And... It's just a difficult spot to be in. And so here he is, and he's, his heart is towards Absalom. He's concerned about his son. He doesn't know what's going to become of him out in Geshur. He doesn't know what's going to happen in the days and the weeks and possibly years ahead. And Joab sees all of this. Remember, Joab is the son of Zariah, David's sister, which means Joab is his nephew. And although he's his nephew, he's probably not too far removed in age from David. He's probably certainly younger, but I wouldn't say he's any more than 10 years younger or so than David is. Uh, remember, David was the youngest. Zariah may have been much older than him, and therefore she could have had these sons of hers that were somewhat close in age to her youngest brother. And so here we have David. We have his nephew Joab. And Joab is also his captain of the host. This presents quite a few problems. Remember, it was Joab who also killed the previous captain of the host, Abner. And that created grief in David's life and grief in David's heart. Uh, and he even said at one moment, the sons of Zariah, meaning Joab and then Abishai, as well as the one who was killed, Asahel, he says, they're too much for me. And here's the reason why. Uh, they were men who probably thought they were making a difference, but they went about things in the flesh 
they did things not necessarily always led by the Lord. Certainly not led by the Lord in some of the actions that they took. And Joab sees that David is grieved and he says, you know, I'm going to do something about this. He was used to winning wars and fighting battles. He was a man of action. And so he concocts a plan and he finds a woman, a wise woman, and he tells her, he says, I want you to act as though you're a widow woman and as though you have been grieving for years. And I want you to put on mourning clothes and look as though you've been mourning and, and weeping for years. And I want you to go to the king and, and I want you to bring this situation before him and tell him that you have two grown sons or had two grown sons and they got in a disagreement. They got in a fight out in the field and things escalated so that your one son killed the other son. And now because of that, the rest of your family, they're seeking to avenge the blood of your son who was killed. And now they want to kill your other son. And you need to tell David that you are grieved because if your other son is killed, she mentions it here, her coal will be put out, meaning her lineage will be gone. She'll have no sons at that point. And I want you to just bring this sob story before the king and let him know how upset you are because if his life is taken, then all will be lost. And all of it is a big made up lie. And Joab told this woman to do this, and she does. I don't know if Joab knew the way that Nathan confronted David, and now he thinks he's going to come up with his own emotional word picture, maybe in a not-so-spiritual way. But he does so by fashioning a lie. And I want to bring us to our first thought in all of this, and that is this. We must deal with issues and problems in a right and spirit-filled manner. Romans 12, 9 tells us this, abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. We must have a desire to do what is right. James chapter 4 and verse 17 says this, therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The Lord has given to all of us a conscience. Those of us who are saved have the Holy Spirit of God who speaks to our conscience and indwells us and lets us know what is right or wrong. And we, of all people, should know what is right. And if we don't do what is right, if we decide to go the other way, listen, to us who know that it is right, and we decide not to do it, and we decide to maybe commit a sin of omission, we don't do what we know we're supposed to do, the Bible says to him it is sin. David is omitting here what he should do. What he should have done is punished his son Absalom, even though he himself was guilty as a murderer. He should have dealt with Absalom. He should have had him own up and face the consequences, even if it meant he had to go to jail for a while or whatever he needed to do. He needed to deal with him. But you know what David does? He doesn't deal with him. He absolves himself of doing what needs to be done. And I have found that sometimes, even fathers especially, won't deal with their children, with their children at home, or maybe even trying to help their adult children because they have been guilty of the very same thing. I want to say tonight, don't be guilty of that. It would be worse for you to see a problem in your, in your child at home or out of the home and then not deal with it because you know you're guilty of the same sin. What we need to do is say, Lord, I'm seeing in my son, I'm seeing in my daughter where I am, uh, where I am deficient and where I have my failings and I need to deal with them. Give me the strength, give me the wisdom, give me the help to do so. I sometimes in dealing with my own kids have had to say, listen, I have this same problem. You've seen me do what you've just done and that's partly to blame but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to deal with you about it. And it doesn't mean that I'm not going to make you face the consequences for it. Make your children face the consequences. And then own up to, and say, listen, I, I have the same issue. I have the same problem. David was the king. He let Absalom flee. Joab sees that he's upset. So Joab, 
he, he concocts this false story and he tries to deal with an issue in a wrong way. We know this, and I've said this before, but this is my second thought. We can orchestrate a right or desirable result by doing the wrong thing. Sometimes we might want to bring about a good thing, but you can't sin or do something wrong in order to try to achieve that. This is what Joab does. To him, the end justifies the means. Well, I think I can work this out. I'm just trying to help the king. I'm just trying to help him see what he needs to see. And this woman, she's found out. David says, let me ask you something. Does Joab have anything to do with this? It says, though he knows. Let me, just answer me this one question. Is Joab behind this? And she relents and says, yes. As a matter of fact, he came up with the whole thing. He gave me the words to say, sorry. He told me to say it, and so I said it. But we do want to know, why would you protect me and my son from retribution, and yet you're keeping your son banished in Gesher and not bringing him here and not dealing with him? And so we, we see this whole thing come to the forefront. I think sometimes we try to reason within ourselves why we do what we do. And we can sometimes say, well, I think God understands, or I, I think it's all right to do things this way. It'd be far better for us not to act at all and just pray and leave it with the Lord. I like to see things done and accomplished. Sometimes in my desire to want to see something done, I have interjected myself. And it's always eye-opening when the Lord shows you what you thought would bring about a certain result did not come to fruition. All you did was murky and muddy up the situation more. You made it worse. Type A people who like to see things done have to learn this lesson. We are not God. God is God and we are not. Sometimes we like to orchestrate. Sometimes we like to piece things together. We like to try to insert ourselves and we think, well, I'm going to make this right or I'm going to bring it together. Or I'm going to, you know, get accolades for it. Or I'm just going to be seen as a person who made it all work out. And time and time again, we have to learn hard lessons. The Lord's in control. It'd be far better if we just sat back and said, you know, I can't do anything and still be right by God and others by doing it. I'm just going to leave it to the Lord. I'm going to pray about this. I'm going to leave it in God's all-sufficient, sovereign hands and will. We need to learn that. Joab is happy that David relents and says, okay, bring Absalom back. And it would have been good if David did bring Absalom back and then dealt with him. Let's read on and see what he does. Verse 23. So Joab arose and went to Geshur and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. And the king said, let him turn to his own house and let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house and saw not the king's face. But in all Israel, there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty. From the sole of his foot, even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish. And when he pulled his head, for it was at every year's end that he pulled it, because the hair was heavy on him, therefore he pulled it. He weighed the hair of his head at 200 shekels after the king's weight. And this guy had no problem with balding, in case you were wondering. He had so much hair and it grew so much that he cut it and weighed it. And he had more and more to give. Man, this is like a, an ancient day Fabio, if you can think of that. I don't know if that was a good comparison to make, but I'm just thinking someone with long flowing, lots of locks. Verse 27, and unto Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamar. She was a woman of a fair countenance. So Absalom dwelt two full years in Jerusalem and saw not the king's face. My third thought is we must determine to stand by doing right and refuse to give in to compromise. David is the definition of a compromiser in this passage. He's trying to have it both ways. To a certain extent, he listens to Joab, and he brings him back. And bringing him back was a great idea. 
as long as he dealt with them properly. <clears throat> but you know how David dealt with the situation? He said, okay, bring my son back and he can go live at his house, but I'm not going to look at him. He's not allowed to come to the palace. I'm not going to entertain his presence. He shall not see my face. That's wrong. That is what we would call uh, unresolved issue coming to the forefront. And you know, it's interesting. People have these in their lives. There are unresolved issues that they just let go on. This was a big one. His own son now lives back in Jerusalem at his own house, but David says, I'm not going to look at him. Do you think that made the situation better? Do you think Absalom felt better living in his own house and near the palace to the king, but the king won't even look at him? Oh, no, not at all. Maybe it would have been better if he just left him in Geshur if this is how he was going to deal with it. So not only is he not dealing with the sin that his son committed, the heinous crime of premeditated murder against his own brother, but now he's not even going to look at or talk to his son. Don't let that happen in your life. Don't make the mistake of becoming estranged from family members. My heart goes out to those who have no choice in the matter. Some of you have been rejected by family. And my heart goes out to you. And some of you have shared those situations with me. When I, every time I hear that, I just, I want to cry. Sometimes I do. Because if it were up to you, you would do anything to be reunited with your family. Maybe you've tried over and over and over again, and I commend you for that. And I would say, as much as you're able to, keep trying as much as you can. And sometimes, no matter what we do, we can't make it happen. And there comes a point in time where we just have to keep praying for those who we are close to. Maybe our own blood family who won't even look at us or see us. That's difficult. That's hard. But may we never be the guilty party who says, I'm not talking to you. I'm not looking at you. I will have nothing to do with you. That should never come from our end of things. Stand by doing the right thing, but never give in to compromise. So Absalom now is there. He's two full years in Jerusalem. We read that he has a family himself. He has sons and daughters. He's a beautiful man. So much hair that he has to chop it and weigh it. And he just continues. He is looked to as perhaps the heir apparent. People, probably because of his good looks and charisma and ability with people, probably start to think, this is going to be our next king. He's going to fill David's shoes. It seems even like the way this woman was speaking that not only was David upset that Absalom wasn't there, but Joab and the rest of Israel were upset that Absalom wasn't around. So you have to understand Yes, Absalom committed a crime and murdered Abnon, but a lot of people didn't really think of him as a murderer, or they probably realized that he did kill his brother, but they all probably thought to themselves, well, he had good reason. We know what he did to his sister, you see? And so the hearts of many of the people were probably with this man. David won't look at him, verse 29. Therefore, Absalom sent for Joab to have sent him to the king. Absalom's had enough after two years, and he sends for Joab, and he's basically saying, you brought me here. You set up a meeting with my dad. You set it up so I can see the king. Notice, but he would not come to him. And when he sent again the second time, he would not come. Therefore, he said unto his servants, see, Joab's field is near mine, and he hath barley there. Go and set it on fire. And Absalom's servants set the field on fire. That's one way to get people's attention. I don't suggest it. But Absalom says, if I can't get Job's attention, I'll set his whole yard on fire. By the way, Absalom was probably the only one in the entire world who could get away with this. Joab was the captain of the host. No one messed with him. Absalom says, watch this. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom unto his house and said unto him, Wherefore have thy servants set my field on fire? And Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I have sent unto thee, saying, Come hither, 
that I may send thee to the Canaan and say, Wherefore am I come from Geshur? It had been good for me to have been there still. Now therefore let me see the king's face, and if there be any iniquity in me, let him kill me. Absalom here, I think, still at this place, wants things to be done right. He even says, I'm ready to die. If it means that I need to be put to death for what I've done because of my sin, let's let it happen. So I see a heart here of a man who wants reconciliation with his dad. Dads, love your kids. Reach out to your kids. Make sure that they know that you love them and that they can always come to you. Even if you err on the side of being or seeming overly interested, I'd rather be that way than the other way. <laughs> At lunch, I was asking Trent some questions, and he says, you just need to chill out. He said, you seem way too concerned about me or concerning this. Just chill out. Leave me alone. You know? All right. But at least he knows that I'm concerned. I love him. I want to know what's going on. You know, he's 18. And there was something I was asking him about. And he had been tired of being asked. And it wasn't the kind of thing that I deserved to have to know. But, uh, but sometimes we might say, well, I, I, I love my kids. And I, I want them to know it. Then just show it. Even if they feel like you love them too much, you can never love your kids too much. I'd rather err that way than the other way. So what happens? Verse 33, so Joab came to the king and told him, and when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. That's all we're told. The king didn't deal with Absalom. He didn't cause him to face what he had done. As far as we know, he never had any words exchanged. Because we're going to find out in the very next chapter, Absalom is a rebellious, rebellious son. But I would say right up until the end of this chapter, I would contend that he wasn't. Because if you read into this, he wanted everything to be made right even if it meant he lost his own life for it. And David had a golden opportunity. But all we see is that he kissed his son. Okay, that's great that he kissed him. Sometimes we think a single action will take care of things. In this situation, it's a kiss. Maybe we buy something for our kids. Maybe we do something in some display of affection. I can promise you this, your children and your family and those that you love want your continued investment and interest day after day in their life, not just a one-off. Christmas is great, but they forget about the Christmas gifts soon after the season is done. Birthdays are wonderful, and you can make the cake and have the pictures and all that. But if we're just making these little displays, but we're not giving ourselves to our family, to our spouse, to our children, we're robbing them. And again, it's easy for us to read this and say, David just missed this opportunity. David was dealing with a lot. I've never murdered somebody. I don't know what that felt like. I've never murdered someone and then watched my son do the same thing that I did and have to go through all of that. Maybe in your life it's not murder you're talking about, but maybe it's some other sin. Maybe it's a moral sin or maybe it's a sin of commission or a sin of omission. And, and, and now you, you have the chance to deal with it or make it right in the next generation. And sometimes we withdraw ourselves and we don't. I would say that's not what God wants us to do. Invest yourself in those that you love. Don't ever let issues go unresolved. God wants us to deal with issues. Here's what I know about our Lord and Savior. He doesn't let issues go unresolved in our relationship with him, does he? The Bible says, whom the Lord chasteneth, he loveth. When we're wrong and we're not right with God and we're rebelling from the Lord, you know what he does? He, he pursues after us. 
He deals with us. He brings us through things. I think time and again, I've seen myself as a prodigal son to God. I think in some way we could all say that about ourselves. And time and again, God gets my attention. And time and again, the Lord brings me back and the Lord convicts my heart. And the Lord shows me what needs to be made right. And it's hard to go through all that. But I'm thankful that my Father in heaven loves me enough to keep coming back to me. And he keeps praying for me. And he's waiting for me to come back. And he, he's knocking on the door of my heart. And like the prodigal son, when he returned to his father, our father is there with open arms and he receives us to himself. That's the heart of our God. That's the heart of our Lord. Don't withdraw yourself from those that God's given to you. Invest yourself. Love them. Give yourself. Make it a priority. Make it a priority to show the ones that God's given to you that you love them with everything that you have. The issues that you have, God can deal with those. But the ones that God's given us, we have a responsibility to love them and to try to show them that we want their attention and that we're trying to help them. And I know sometimes there's strained family relationship and strained friendships and, and everything else. But let's keep working to love God and love others. And I believe the Lord will help us along the way. We should ask ourselves tonight, we should say, is there anything unresolved between me and my Father in heaven? Is there anything unresolved between me and someone else? If so, I wonder if I can extend an olive branch. I wonder if there's a way that I can try to show again that I want a relationship. If you'll do that, I believe God will help and bless that. If you do that and it's rebuffed and it's not accepted, at least you have extended the heart of our Savior, the love of Christ, to those that God has given you. That's the message tonight. I hope it's a help. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? The results of compromising on unsolved issues, unresolved issues, can be de devastating. David kissed his son, but it seems like that's all he did. And we read in the very next verse that his son began to subvert and undercut and literally do everything he could to try to steal the kingdom. That's tragic. But I do believe that maybe if David sat down and talked with his son for a number of hours and explained how he would have to face some consequences for what he did and demand that he do so and, and brought these things into focus and dealt with them as they should have been dealt with, perhaps the rest of what we read about Absalom and what he did wouldn't have ever happened. I wonder tonight what we are allowing to take place because we're just not engaging with those that God has given to us, our family members, those under our authority, our spouse, our children, our fellow believers in Christ, our neighbors, the ones that God's given us. Let's not ever let issues go unresolved. They're going to come up. Problems will happen but with the help of God and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, we can resolve anything. Lord, I ask that you would help us tonight. I pray that you would give us wisdom. If there's something unresolved, I pray that we would resolve it and just be open, honest, be willing to apologize for something we may have done. But at the same time, Lord, deal with issues and help people to see where they need help in their own life. And Lord, especially those that we love and are close to. Lord, I pray that you would give us help in these areas. And Lord, we can't be like Joab and try to force a situation. We can't orchestrate righteousness, especially when we do things in a wrong way but we can pray 
and we can have wisdom and we can follow the example of the Lord Jesus. And I pray that that's what we do. Help us, Lord, tonight. Speak to hearts. Have your way. And I pray, Lord, that we would work to be right with you and right with others, to love you and love others, even as our own selves. And we'll trust you to show us the way to do that. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me, please? We'll just take a moment or two for one or two verses of invitation, but I don't know how the Lord would use this tonight, but let's pray to the Lord. Let's, let's make an altar. Let's talk to him. Is there something that we need to resolve? Is there maybe a relationship that needs to be restored? Uh, maybe there's a, a close friend that is no longer a close friend or maybe a brother or sister that we need to be reunited with. I'm going to ask Margaret to play. Whatever the need might be tonight, would you pray? Would you come? Maybe there's something we need to ask the Lord to help us with. I wanted to mention that somebody gave me um, a couple reins in the ladies' restroom that were taken off, maybe when their hands were washed. That's for you all? Oh, okay. <laughs> Brother Kushel said, those are my reins. No. Um, but if, they're, if these are your reins, then um, just see me. Uh, I think someone took them off. I don't, I, it doesn't look like they are in, an engagement set. It might just be a, some reins that someone had on. I don't know if it's from someone this morning, but uh, if you left them and you took them off to wash your hands or something, just... Let me know that. I hope you have a great week. We look forward to being back again on Wednesday night. And so let's be together and uh, let's find someone to be an encouragement and a blessing to. If there's unresolved issues, let's deal with those. I, I, I don't preach these messages because I think there is. Uh, I just get to the next place in scripture and that's where I'm preaching. And so uh, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of interpersonal relationships in the story of David, isn't there? And uh, just from so many different angles, and it, it really, if we'll study these things, it can really help us to see a lot. And uh, so I hope it's a help to you. Let's have a great week. Let's be back together at the appointed time on Wednesday. And uh, youth group will be at 6 o'clock like normal. 7 o'clock will be our evening, or, yeah, our evening uh, midweek prayer service, King's Kids. And there's really only a few more weeks of King's Kids and youth group left. So let's take advantage of it. Looking forward to all that is ahead. Let's be dismissed now in a word of prayer. I said Steve Adams this morning. My dad thought that I said dad. And uh, so anyway, I'm going to let him close out tonight because he was so eager to close us out this morning. <laughs> okay, good. He heard me tonight. <laughs> Amen. God bless you.